Welcome to another video in our lecture series on forecasting. My name is Stefan Kolasa. I'm a data science expert at SAP Switzerland. I'm also affiliated with the Lancaster Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. And today we'll be talking about forecast improvement, the what, the when, and the how. All right, let's start with the what, the what of forecast improvement. What is it about forecasting that might need improvement or that might profit from improvement? And actually forecasting has many different dimensions that we might want to keep in mind when we think about forecast improvement. And uh, the one that everybody is thinking about when they think about forecasting is accuracy. And closely related to that is business value. And I'm going to argue that there is a relationship, but not a very straightforward relationship between the two. And I'm going to argue that a, a single-minded obsession with improving forecast accuracy does not necessarily uh, add any business value to what we're doing. However, there are also other dimensions that we need to keep in mind when we think about improving our forecasts. One other dimension is the resource requirement in forecasting, because forecasts require resources and different methods, different processes in forecasting require different amounts, different kinds of resources. And we can think about improving forecasts in this direction. Closely related to that is speed. I'm going to talk about that later on, and it's not exactly the same as resource requirement, but it's related. And then in a slightly different direction, we have understandability and explainability, because forecasts can be understandable or not, they can be explainable or not, and forecasts can be improved by making them more understandable, because in the end, it's humans that need to understand the forecasts and need to be able to trust them and to act on them. And if they don't understand the forecast, they're not going to trust them. And finally, again, related to the understandability and explainability aspect is the maintainability and debuggability. So I'm actually coining new terms here. I'm just like Shakespeare, I'm the Shakespeare of forecasting. The maintainability and debuggability means we have a forecast or a forecast for an entire set of time series or uh, whatever we want to forecast, and uh, we see that some of them are bad in different ways. So how do we debug the forecasts, and can we do that uh, without improving matters on one hand and making stuff much worse on the other hand? All right, let's go into these uh, in detail. Let's start out with uh, the big accuracy elephant in the room, the one that everybody's thinking about, accuracy. So accuracy and business value, not the same thing, but still something we want to keep in mind. First thing to know here is that forecast accuracy is actually uh, surprisingly hard to measure. And you might think uh, it's, it's easy to just uh, calculate errors of forecasts and add them up and take averages of those errors. And actually, uh, surprisingly, much can go wrong there. And it's not going to be the topic of this presentation, but actually figuring out how to measure your accuracy uh, is something you need to invest a little brain power into especially when it comes to slow moving or intermittent products, products that only sell rarely. If you want to forecast those and measure your accuracy, you can be led astray by things like the mean absolute error. It can simply be not measure, do not measure what you want to measure. And in addition, uh, once you've measured your accuracy, the business value of a forecast, of a better or worse forecast, remain, depends not on the, on the accuracy of the forecast, but on a host of other influencing factors, like the entire decision-making process. How do I take the forecast and any other uh, factors that come in and turn that into a business decision? Uh, especially, but not only, stuff like logistical and supply chain constraints. If I can only replenish and pack sizes of eight, then it doesn't really matter whether I'm forecasting three or five units demand. I'm always going to put in one pack of eight. So whether uh, the three forecast or the five forecast was more accurate, it does not matter. What's frequently underestimated is the robustness aspect of forecasts. And that is especially important once you move away from the pure time series algorithms like ARIMA, exponential smoothing. Once you have causal models like regression, uh, random forests, neural networks, boosting, all these kinds of things. Once you have many, many different influencing factors and see my presentation on retail forecasting for one example for those, uh, things can go wrong. You can get forecasts that are badly off, very, very badly off. And the robustness of forecasting refers to um, are our forecasts not only good on average, but are there any really 
bad forecasts among the set? Are there any howlers? The stuff that people see and that people know instinctively this can't be right. Because if you have forecasts like those, uh, trusts erodes very quickly. And the problem is once you have a large amount of forecasts, when, once you have many products to be forecasted in many locations, chances are that there will be a few such holders somewhere in your data set and you don't want those. So uh, what you always want to keep in mind is not only improving forecast accuracy or business value on average, but also making sure that there is not so much sensitivity uh, in your system that it might end up with badly wrong forecasts once in a while. You want to have robust forecasts. The second aspect that we're going to talk about is uh, resource requirements. What are the resource requirements in forecasting? Uh, there's different things here. There's data. We need data to forecast. And sometimes we need less data. Sometimes we need more data. Sometimes we need a, a focal time series that we want to forecast with stuff like ARIMA, exponential smoothing, and so on. Uh, sometimes we just want uh, related time series. If we're cold, start forecasting new products. Then we don't have a focal time series, but we need the, focal time, the forecast for the related products in related locations. But you would also need stuff like drivers, features, product hierarchies, location hierarchies, all these things. And these can be of good quality or of bad quality. Processing resources. Processors, cycles, uh, how much time do I have, how much processing time do I have to buy at Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure for my huge uh, neural network forecast. Uh, storage space, how much do I need to store? Do I need to store my, for my forecast on a very granular level or on a more aggregate level? Electricity, quite simply electricity, the simple resource requirements of forecasting in terms of electricity, they're humongous when you're a retailer. Uh, you might have a CO2 footprint simply from the, re from the electricity requirements of your forecasting process uh, that can translate into tens of thousands of cars once you move towards a more sophisticated forecast using neural networks and similar model modern methods. So you want to keep that in mind. Uh, licensing fees. If you're uh, not building your own method, then, uh, but licensing or buying somebody else's solution, then you need to pay for that. Uh, other resource requirements that your forecasts might have is expertise. If you have an exponential smoothing method, then uh, many people can understand exponential smoothing and can make that work for your system. That's not a problem. But once you run into boosting, once you have uh, neural networks and similar methods, you need people that actually understand these things. And at some point in time, uh, you'll have PhDs among your forecasters and those don't come cheap. So you need data science expertise. And uh, this is a resource requirement of your forecast. Um, but it could also be a question of IT requirements. Once you have a larger system, uh, which doesn't run on your uh, run of the middle laptop anymore. Once you need a computing cluster, uh, you need to talk to people who actually know how to work with full computing clusters, with cloud computing, uh, dealing with Amazon Web Services, and so on and so forth. Those are not forecasters. Those are IT people, professionals. And they, again, they don't come cheap. You might have them in-house. You might need a new function for somebody who has the technical aspects of your forecasting because you just decided to use a more um, advanced, more modern, more complicated forecasting solution rather than a simple Excel spreadsheet that somebody might hack together on their laptop. I'm not saying that is a good idea, uh, but it could in principle do it. And then again, conversely, if you have a better forecasting process, a better pipeline that takes your forecast, turns it into business value, or takes your initial data, turns it into forecast, turns it into business value, that might actually liberate expertise. Perhaps not liberate expertise in terms of forecasts, but uh, you might have demand planners and subject matter experts, business experts, that might be liberated from the drudgery of forecasting to do more value-added stuff because you just implemented a better forecasting workflow. So you might even get a better, um, um, uh, essentially a negative resource requirement out of improving your forecasts. And of course, one resource that you need is time, see speed, so we'll move to that one now. So the speed of forecasting, how does forecasting have a speed dimension. There's actually 
two different dimensions that we have here. There's training time requirements, and there is, uh, I'm going to call it scoring time requirements. So where's the difference? The training time is where you fit your models, where you, you decide on which model you use, you estimate your model, you may debug your model, you train your model, all these things that can essentially done be done more or less offline. You can do that perhaps even ahead of time before you get the last data point in. And at some point in time, you have a fitted model, an estimated model, and then you evaluate that for your forecasts. And the separation is not always clear cut because if you have an ARIMA model or an exponential smoothing model, the training time doesn't take so much time. So it usually makes no sense to separate these two apart. And you just do both of them at the same step. You fit and forecast out and it's not a big deal really. But once you look at modern methods, I'm always doing this little distinction here. Once you have a neural network or a boosting method, uh, you might spend days or weeks or months deciding on which model. You might then take days on the Amazon Web Services uh, computing platform to fit the model that you've decided on. You might be cranking tons of data through that. And then at the end, you have a model that's somewhere in the cloud. And then you just press one button to get a forecast out. And that happens essentially immediately. And then you change one input parameter. You say, okay, what's gonna happen if I discontinue this product and increase prices on that product? You put that data into your model, you press a button and out comes a new forecast based on the trained model. You don't retrain the model, you just change the input causal data. And then the scoring, the evaluation, what comes out, the actual calculation of forecasts comes out in immensely quickly. So the speed aspect here is mainly a question of the training time requirements. So you have to think about, do I want to build a forecast that is possibly more accurate or improves in terms of forecast improvement in some other dimension, uh, but that takes two months of training time every half year, or worse, uh, that takes a week of training time and you have to train, retrain it every single day. Then you have a bit of a problem because you take need to have a full week of training time and you have to do that every single day. So essentially you'll have to replicate it seven times. So you have to uh, seven different training processes running in parallel and gets hugely complicated. And all that again, it costs money. All right, but also related to this, uh, if you take a step back and look at the larger picture, not only look at the statistical and IT aspects of forecasting, but also at the social and process requirements. Forecasting is not uh, the stuff that happens in your computer. Forecasting is the entire process. Uh, somebody collects the data, somebody cleans the data, sometimes uh, the data goes into the system, models are fit, selected, estimated, forecasted. And then at some point in time, people come in and start uh, improving the forecasts or judgmentally adjusting them. Let's hope they're improving them. At that process, again, takes time. And you should really keep in mind the entire time that you have in your process. How much, how much time does it take for the entire forecasting process to turn into a business decision at the end? And the last step is usually the sales and operations planning process. And that is a step that, again, takes a lot of time. Understandability and explainability. Um, how well can your forecast be explained? Uh, it's easy to, under, to explain the overall historical average forecast. Just take historical average data from your time series and forecast that out and there it is. May not be very good, but it's very easy to understand. Or the naive forecast, just take the last time point and last observation, forecast that out. Again, very easy to understand. Uh, once you come to exponential smoothing, it gets a little harder, or ARIMA, again, harder. And then at some point in time, you have your deep AR network. Um, not uh, complaining about deep AR, which is a wonderful model, but it gets complicated because it's a neural network and nobody can understand it. Why does my forecast have this particular value? Why am I forecasting 10.3 and not 11.8? And uh, people will start asking that question, especially if the forecast diverges from their expectations. Or retrospectively, if the forecast turned out to be very bad, they like to understand why did I forecast 10.3 and not the 50.1 that it turned out to be that was the actual value. Why was the forecast so far off? And you'll need to understand that and explain that, especially to people who may not have a deep technical expertise and understanding. And they'll need to understand that not uh, into every detail, but they'll need to understand it well enough to trust your forecast and to say, okay, perhaps this forecast was bad, but in general, I'm trusting what this system does, what this process does, and I know that 
bad things will be an aberration, it will not happen often, and we can live with the few times that bad things happen. We have this term, explainable AI, XAI, that's been around for a couple of years now, and that's a research effort, essentially, to, you, to take AI, artificial intelligence methods, like deep learning, similar things, and explain them to humans, and uh, turn these into uh, explanations that humans can actually consume and understand. The question then always is, is the explanation actually about the forecast, about where the forecast comes from, or did we just fit a simpler model to the forecast and explain that simpler model, like a linear regression or something? Uh, that's a bit of a difference because uh, one of the two, the explaining the forecast itself, is better for actually debugging the forecast. Which leads us to our next topic here, maintainability and debuggability. How easy is it to systematically change a forecast? Of course, we can always take a forecast and change it and just overwrite it. That's judgmental adjustment. That's easy. Question is, uh, if we see that there's something systematically wrong in our forecast, it always forecasts wrongly in one particular situation, can we change that in a way that doesn't break stuff somewhere else? Because if we have something like a local method, like exponential smoothing, ARIMA, stuff that only works on a single time series, you can usually work on those surgically, I'm going to call it. You can just change it for this one situation. You can be reasonably confident it's not going to break stuff somewhere else. If you have a global method, like boosting or deep learning or something like that, you change something here and uh, stuff breaks over there. It's, uh, it's, it can be complicated and it's, it's hard to really change matters here. All right, let's go on to the when of forecast improvement. So when should we actually try to improve our forecast? I'm going to concentrate here on the accuracy and business value aspect because most of the others, well, we'd be standing here all day. I don't want to do that to you. So when is it worthwhile to improve forecast accuracy and business value later on? So first off, as I said, accuracy is not an end in itself. Accuracy is, an, is a means to an end, and the end is business value. We're not forecasting just for the joy of it. Um, so how does improved accuracy translate into business value? So the idea really is we have a forecast and we suspect that we, if we improved accuracy, we might generate more business value down the line at the end. How do we find out whether that hunch is actually correct and whether then it is worthwhile to invest in improving accuracy? How we do that, we're going to come to that in a few minutes. So there's actually two different ways of translating forecast accuracy into business value. The one is to model the relationship, and the other one is to simulate the relationship. So in possibility one, uh, well, we collect just tons of forecasts and tons of associated business values, and then we model the relationship between the two, like using regression or machine learning, and then we say, okay, and now what would have happened? How would our business value have developed if we had a, an accuracy that was better or even an accuracy that was worse? So we can just predict the business value of a, an improved forecast accuracy. Uh, you can do that, and if your data scientists can deal with deep learning for forecasting, they can certainly build a model for, your, for the relationship between business value and forecast accuracy. The hard part here is usually, is usually uh, getting a handle on this business value thing because the business value that depends on a particular forecast can be hard to really disentangle because of all those things that come on later in the process, like the logistical constraints. If you have logistical constraints across multiple products and it's hard to see how the forecast accuracy on one product translates into business value on the full lorry or truck that you ordered later on for that product and for all the other products that were in the same lorry. Possibility two, you model the decisions, the model, the, the entire value chain, how your forecast turns into a business decision. And of course, you need to simplify there because there's just so many things happening here. So perhaps you just do a very simple logistical model and you abstract away from all the judgmental adjustment and just say, okay, we have a forecast here. Uh, and we model in a rough way how that would turn into a, an order at the end, for instance. And then you can simulate the outcome for more or less accurate forecasts. And then again, you have a relationship between accuracy and business value at the end. The model uh, way is simpler than simulation because you don't have to think about the entire logistical or the entire decision process that comes after the forecast. 
but it might be misleading, especially if there's discontinuities. If your forecast accuracy changes in a small way, then it probably is not going to change much in terms of the business decision. And that's really this example about the logistical units and, and the forecast not uh, changing much. Uh, the forecast accuracy not having much of an impact if your logistical units are of a certain value. And uh, conversely, the modeling approach is a little more complicated than um, the simulation approach is a little more complicated than the modeling approach. Uh, and I personally would say that's a feature, that's not a bug, because it really forces you to think about the relationship between the forecast and the business decision. <laughs> that really, it, it won't let you off the hook by just saying, let's improve forecast accuracy and business value will magically appear somewhere else. Uh, and this way, it really forces you to think about the relationship and how the one turns into the other it lays bare the important drivers of business value. And it also allows tweaking other parameters. So, okay, uh, perhaps forecast accuracy improvement doesn't translate into, bus into business value, but perhaps changing the logistical parameters changes business value. Oh, look, we just learned that we don't need to invest in improving our forecast accuracy. We need to invest in uh, dealing with our suppliers and uh, convincing them to have better conditions for us, be more flexible in their supply chain, stuff like that. Uh, therefore, I would say that this uh, simulation approach is a little more informative than modeling. An example, uh, here's a time series uh, from the recent M5 forecasting competition. That's just daily demand for a particular stock keeping unit in one Walmart store over a couple of years. And uh, what I did here, it's a little paper in Foresight, very, very much recommended publication. Take a look at that. Uh, where. I just modeled in a very, very simple way how a forecast for this time series could turn into, into service levels at the store by saying, okay, I have a forecast and I'm going to stock up using that forecast with certain logistical pack sizes. And what came out was that the relationship between forecast accuracy and business value in this simulation uh, approach was uh, there was a relationship, uh, higher accuracy turned into better business value, turned into more better service levels essentially for small pack sizes. But once the pack sizes in which we replenished were larger, once we could also always replenish in pack sizes of four, there was essentially no relationship between accuracy and business value at all. And more importantly, every forecast, almost regardless of the accuracy, turned into a service level that exceeded the target service level that we had set as a target. So essentially in a situation like this, uh, the thing you want to look at is not the forecast accuracy, it's the logistical parameters after the forecast. Uh, one thing that often comes up is can't we use published knowledge? Isn't there something about this relationship between accuracy and business value somewhere out there? People must have been thinking about that. I'm saying, uh, well, actually, there are people that will say there is a straightforward relationship. It, we, if you reduce the MAPE by X percent, then your business uh, bottom line will go up by Y percent. And we know how to do that and hire us and we'll tell you how to do that. Uh, I would say that is snake oil and that it's completely worthless because this relationship hugely depends on your particular situation uh, because of all these logistical constraints that I've been harping on. And also because improving accuracy may be expensive. It may be easy to improve forecast accuracy if you're starting from a very immature process. But if you already have a good process, then you probably, it's going, it's going to be hard because all the low hanging fruit have been picked and you have to reach up higher and higher to reach the higher fruit and uh, before you can improve forecast accuracy. And at some point in time, uh, the impact on the bottom line may be negative because it just spent so much on improving your forecast accuracy that the business value that was bigger at the end it simply didn't pay for it. So in the end, uh, I would say there is no alternative to doing your own homework and of course always doing using this 80-20 rule. Don't model your entire supply chain and to find out the relationship between accuracy and business value because that's just going to be prohibitively complicated, just do an 80-20 rule. And, but unfortunately, that's exactly why you need experts and your own experts uh, to do that. All right, so in the end, uh, look at the entire picture. Accuracy is not everything. And actually, let's now finally go to how do we actually improve the forecast? So we've now found out what's there about forecast accuracy improvement or forecast improvement, when we want to fore uh, improve forecast accuracy, 
especially accuracy, and now how do we do that? Um, unfortunately, there is a very simple process to forecast accuracy improvement. So I'm, again, um, or actually I'm improving the entire forecasting process. There's three steps. Step one is to understand your data. Step two is to understand your data. Step three is to understand your data because uh, you really need to understand your data. And once you understand what data you have, what data you need, where the relationship between the two is, whether there is uh, problems with data quality or data availability or anything else, after that, you can start and improve your clean your data because surprisingly often, it's not a question of, it's more a question of availability and of cleanliness of your data, uh, much more than of changing the model. And only after you've understood your data and cleaned your data, can you think about changing the model or changing the process. So I would always say, start with the data, understand the data deeply, deeply, deeply. As an example, uh, there was once a thread on Cross-Validated, which is a Q&A site for statistics on the internet. And somebody asked about understanding the Croston method, which we'll come to in a later video, which is a specialized forecasting method for intermittent products or intermittent demands. Uh, so time series that are lots of zeros and then a one, lots of zeros and then a one or a two and lots of zeros again. And uh, so I looked at that data and it turns out that the time series looked like this. So yes, there were lots of zeros in that time series, but it was not intermittent in, a, in the sense of having ones every now and then. It was intermittent or it was seasonal in the sense of having clear seasonal peaks at certain points in the year and zero outside of that. So it was perhaps some kind of fresh fruit or produce that simply had only a season in during few, a few weeks in the year. So it was not a question of understanding the cross method for intermittent demands, but in understanding how to fit a seasonal model to this kind of data. So it was not really understanding intermittent demand. It was understanding that this time series was strongly seasonal. So what about our data? Could we understand better? Seasonality, just saw an example of that. There could be multiple seasonality. Do we have to deal with seasonality Within each week, if we have daily data, do we have to understand seasonality within each day? If we have call center data, for instance, because their call centers have strong intraday seasonality and intraweek seasonality, and retail data also have intra-year seasonality, so multiple seasonalities. Could be trend, could be calendar events, but could be causal drivers or associations that help us forecast better, whether they are causal or not. Uh, can we forecast those? Good questions. Uh, prices, promotions, data quality, we've talked about that. Sometimes the data simply is not there. We don't know the past driver data, then we have a bit of a problem. We can't use that for forecasting because we can't learn the relationship between the driver and the focal time series. Stockouts, for instance, if we're demand forecasting, did we have zero sales because we didn't have product on hand? If so, we need to understand that. But the question then is, do we have historical stock data? If we don't have that, we don't know whether we had a historical stock out. Product master data, features, hierarchies, predecessor relationships, stuff like that. So to be, well, to, to wrap up, uh, it's always necessary to keep the big picture in mind. What do we mean by forecast improvement? And it's not only the statistical, the technical, step, the modeling step that needs, may need improvement, but it's the entire process. And uh, to always keep in mind that there is more to forecast improvement than accuracy improvement. There is resource requirements, there is speed, there is understandability, maintainability. And of course, going back to accuracy, there is always this uncertain relationship between accuracy and business value. Thank you very much.